Jack, cheers for uh, for joining me today on, on this session to kind of understand how your career started and how it's progressed, but then also maybe some top tips on on navigating the tech industry. I think one of the things for me, knowing, knowing you and working with you for a few years, is that you, you finally got that, that Microsoft MVP status and then you threw it all the way to work for Microsoft, right? Um, yeah, so it'd be good to hear about that in this conversation, definitely. Um, so yeah, as an intro, just could you introduce yourself and let everyone know who you are and why they should watch this video? Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, I'm Jack Tracy. I am a cloud solutions architect at Microsoft. Um, I, as Kyle quite rightly mentioned, I used to work with Kyle at, uh, at our former employer CDW um, and met a lot of the guys there that you may, may see on this show as also. Um, I was quite rightly an MVP um, before I joined Microsoft. So I got my MVP status in March 2020 uh, and I joined Microsoft in April 2020. So I think I'm the shortest lived MVP ever. Uh, of a month um, and you know it, it was a great thing to, to achieve and something we'll definitely discuss later on but yeah currently at Microsoft uh, and absolutely loving it. Perfect and so let's let's go back in time right so how did your career start and and how's it got to where it is today? Yeah fantastic question so uh, I probably started my IT career back at school in secondary school so I was a big part of um, helping our internal IT team design our new school and what it would look like so I was like they were like throw me Chromebooks or notebooks and like test them out which ones we'd be using and that's really where my like passion for tech started um, and then moving from there I, I went through college and went okay actually I I'm going to be better getting into the industry and certifying whilst I'm there than going the university route so um, I went and got a help desk job standard you know printers broken, reset a password, all that sort of stuff. And from there, I've moved through the typical professional services engineering roles. I took over an engineering management role, um, did that for a few years and figured that management and numbers weren't my thing for a few years. Uh, and then went back into architecture um, after having that sort of engineering experience for sort of four or five years. Uh, and I've been in Azure architecture probably for the last five to six years. Um, and yeah, worked my way through various partners and now working for the mothership. Yeah, definitely. What was it like working for the mothership? How different is it for people being from a reseller world to a vendor space? It's really interesting, actually. You know, and, you know, a lot of the times you probably think from a partner perspective that the, the vendors always, you know, sort of on your side, but might be working against you. Um, I cannot stress enough how much that you're everything we scale through partners right we need partners we can't deliver everything ourselves um we obviously have delivery arms in microsoft consulting services or mcs as everybody knows but you know not a lot of customers use those in terms of the, you know they're more for the very enterprise customers um but then for the rest of the, the market and industry partners are absolutely the way we deliver things so you know i probably speak to partners 75 80 percent of my week and, and the rest of it is just liaising and being the middleman and the glue so if customers need access to sort of roadmap and what's going on or you know really uh, a product group answer that the partner can't have access to you know that's from I, I sit in here i know what's going on i know what's coming and i know what i can share and help customers with with their future plans yeah awesome okay and what would you say one of your your most memorable moments in your career today are I think MVP has to be up there, right? You know, it, it'd be wrong not to mention it. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I run a user group, the Sussex Agile user group down in Brighton um, with one of my, my friends and colleagues now I work with. He's actually my specialist at Microsoft. So he does all the sales stuff, throws it to me and I do all the technical side of things. Um, and, you know, that's been a labor of love, right? So we, we took the jump and went, let's, let's set one up. There's loads in London. There's none in the South Coast. Let's do it. Um, and it was you know, we've been running that nearly 18 months now, um, monthly meetups, Carl, you've been down to talk, yeah. um, and that's on YouTube, and we talked about Windows Virtual Desktop when it was very new, um, and it's a great community, and the, the amount of connections you build from that, but also then I run my own blog, um, we've now started, started doing a podcast, and I put a lot of effort into just being in the community, um, and being out there, because, you know, there are certain things that you come across in your day-to-day -day work that aren't in documentation, somebody's never come across that, that unique scenario. So sharing that that love and sharing that knowledge is absolutely critical. And, you know, luckily enough to be awarded MVP status. Um, I've still got the award, it's, it's over there on, on there uh, and it will still still stay there because, you know, once an MVP, always an MVP, you know, it's, it's an achievement and uh, something I'm very proud of. Yeah, and it's an achievement I'm, I'm, I'm striving for, right? And I think the, 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 the entry criteria is, is second to none compared to the other community programs that I'm involved in um it is a a, a glorified status definitely um, yeah it's, you know when you when you uh, look at the stats somebody's got a power bi dashboard for all the mvps and like you can filter it by country and and uh, category so i was awarded for azure um and i think i was one of like 65 in the uk which is crazy numbers and then like one of maybe 600 in the world 
um, which is phenomenal. And you're right, you know, the entry criteria is really high, um, but Microsoft are really supportive of that process as well. So, you know, like yourself, you've probably had conversations with them about, you, about your nominations and stuff like that and how you go through it. Uh, the one key message I give to people who are looking for MVP status is you shouldn't want an MVP status. Yeah. It should be something you're given because you're uh, prevalent in the community and you do it because you care and you love it. Um, it's just a, an honorary award. And I think the other thing to bear in mind, right, is to get an MVP, you have to actually be nominated by someone in Microsoft or an existing MVP. Absolutely. It's the only way in. So unless you, you have that community engagement and that presence and that relationship, you're not going to get it anyway, because the people that are on these MVP stages are, are out there, are known, and are providing value to all the techies that are out there trying to, trying to find a way in the Microsoft portfolio. Absolutely. I would say Twitter is your, your friend, right? Twitter seems to be the, the hub for us techies nowadays. Um, I certainly get most of my news feed from what's going on in the tech world from Twitter. Um, and you'll find pretty much any MVP on Twitter posting about the latest and greatest things they're doing in their different spaces. So if you're not a, an avid Twitter user, get signed up, start following some people and start, start posting. Yeah, and we had uh, Neil McLaughlin on the other night, who's an MVP for um, the end user services space, ultimately, right? So the EMS portfolio, ultimately in WVD. And so he runs the WVD user group um, as well in the community on that kind of stuff. So it's, it's good to say that everyone's doing a similar kind of thing, right? especially with COVID and the current situation that we're in. Everyone's jumped to the community to actually start giving back a lot more, I think, because they've had a little bit more time potentially to do so with everyone being stuck at home and not being able to travel around the world and country. Yeah, it's been interesting, actually. So we obviously ran the user group and we went to virtual meetups pretty quickly um, once we realised that COVID was, was going to be here for the long haul. Um, we've actually stopped doing sort of community-based Teams meets uh, as we were doing them. Um, it may be something we bring back, but we really miss that that human interaction, I think, as everybody does. Um, but we've actually moved to a podcast to just be a little bit different. Um, actually, you know, from, from my perspective, changing roles during COVID, um, so joining Microsoft right at the beginning of lockdown, um, I've actually had less time than I normally would have because, you know, I'm still learning a new role and getting getting going in a, in a new job. So I have less time. So a podcast is really easy for me because it's less less organisation, less setting up, you know, Teams admin videos, presentations. You know, me and, me and Ryan typically will get a guest along or do it ourselves and we go, this is going to be rough and ready. We are going to hit record and see what happens. And today we haven't had to edit a podcast. Uh, <laughs> the, only, the only problem we've got is it's too long all the time. You know, we go half an hour and then like 45 minutes in, we're like, we still haven't finished. <laughs> Not even halfway through. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Perfect. And what would you say your biggest mistake you've made is and the lesson you learned from it? In terms of my, my career? Yeah. Um, I... This is, this is a really interesting one. I could say one of my biggest pros and biggest cons about me is... I love what I do, as in my hobby is technology. So at the weekends, you'll find me behind my laptop generally in PowerShell, writing ARM templates, you know, doing something that I, I've seen it during the week that I want to go and play with. Um, and the, that, you know, leads itself to a bad work-life balance because I'm always in front of the same thing that I live in front of day in, day out. So, you know, missing out on life, missing out on the social side. You know, I started my career really early. So I, I got into IT at 17 as my first job. Um, and I'm now 27, so I've been in it 10 years. Um, but I never had that uni, that social experience that anything that my wife has had. Um, I've always been like the tag along to her, her social life effectively. So it's that's one thing I've always regretted um, is not taking enough time for me in those in those younger years uh, where I could be out and enjoying life a little bit more. Um, but to say that, you know, what I've done and how hard I've worked to, to get where I am has, you know, afforded me the things in life that I now take for granted. Right. You know, being married, having a house, all those things, you know. It's a, it's a trade-off. Uh, yes, I wish I could have done some more social things in my life, but I also couldn't be where I am today without the hard work I've put in. Um, yeah. I, I put it this way, I don't do the 3 a.m. get-ups now to go to a data centre when a disc has failed and stuff like that. You know, I'm glad <laughs> that I've worked through my, my career, that I don't have to be that, that thing. But I appreciate people who do because I know that the, the struggles and the, the pain that you, you suffer, not only from getting up that early, but also the social side that you yeah. miss out on. Yeah, definitely. I think we talked a lot on sacrifice and these other sessions around family, social time, and even just not even just for career, but for educational purposes, right? So learning. So I think Azure as an example, something new coming out every week almost. How do you keep on top of it? How do you keep it in your brain so you don't forget it? All those kind of things. And the only way to do that is to is to practice it, right? And keep it going. Otherwise, everything you you start to learn, you forget it in a two to three week window. 
Exactly. A Twitter is my fire hose, right? So everything I, I know about what's going on is Twitter. Obviously, working at Microsoft, I see a lot of stuff going around internally as well. Um, but, you know, it's, it's pretty much the same as what we share publicly. So, you know, I have customers come to me and go, have you seen this new feature? And I'm like, no, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Um, but now I'm going to learn very quickly. Um, and yeah, yeah, as you say, it's you, the only time to do that is in your evening. So you, or you'll see me sitting there on my phone watching Netflix, but I'll also have Twitter open reading a blog or reading something that's come out that somebody's posted that I, I find interesting. So, yeah. Lots of time is invested in the tech career. So, so what would you say the day in the life of life of Jack Tracy looks like at the moment then with the Microsoft role? A day in the life of Jack Tracy at the moment is uh, is is getting tougher, I would say, as, as COVID is going on in terms of that, that initial get up and get go. Um, right at the beginning and obviously new job, exciting. You want to get, get involved. But now I'm sort of into that daily run. Um, and yeah, I would say it's, it's tough getting going some mornings because, you know, you know, it's the same day. It's almost like Groundhog Day every day. But I absolutely love what I do. And as soon as I get in front of my desk and I've, I've you know, it got past the, the morning email claims, I, I love it. And uh, I'm, I'm generally, I would say probably 75% of my day is probably spent with customers or partners. So speaking to customers, talking about new um, projects they're working on, talking about existing projects they're working on. How can I help them on block technical, technical challenges, architectural design reviews based on Azure. Um, and then some of that is, you know, more um, people focused. So cloud adoption framework is a lot of my time as well. So mm -hmm. helping people understand actually, yes, you know, Azure is services, VMs, SQL databases, all those things, but actually you've got to, build your, your practice in terms of internally so cloud center of excellences and all those things to get there so that it's a successful journey and it's not a, a bounce back you know we see a lot of people it's easy to consume but it's easy to fall off actually as well and have a bad experience like high bills bad governance bad security going through the cloud adoption framework is an absolutely critical part of that so i spend a lot of my time talking to customers about things like enterprise scale which is new um and all of those sort of things to help them be successful on that longer journey in the cloud and it not just a point in time solution. Um, and then realistically, the evenings are reading tweets, catching up on personal life where I can, um, you know, doing the household chores, like, you know, putting radiators back on walls where we've been decorating and stuff like that, the, the menial things. Uh, and then most importantly, spending time with, with my family where I can. Uh, so just me and my wife um, at home, just having some some downtime. You know, she's, she's a teacher, so she has a pretty stressful job at the moment. Um, and yeah, just making sure we get that downtime and just switching off from, from the wider world. Yeah, and we'll touch on a bit later on in the lightning round, maybe maybe your favourite TV shows and all those kind of things, right? And can see what kind of person you are at that point. I have to start thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so is, is there any point in your career where it's kind of pushed you to the limit, right? Where you've kind of sat there and gone, right, I'm, I'm going to quit. And then you've done something and overcome it. Is there any, has that happened to you as well? Yeah, I would say when I took on, uh, probably when I was 23, 24, uh, I was working for another partner. I'd been in the engineering team for a while. I then took over the management of the engineering team. Um, and I was quite young to go into a management role. And a lot of people went, are you sure about this? And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm good with people. I'm, I, you know, I enjoy sorting out problems. I'm a problem solver. I can't see any problems with this. And it was great. But what the one thing that I, I sort of naively took on was I still kept my chargeable target or a reduced chargeable target for my engineering time. So I was a networking engineer back in the day. Uh, I'm one of only two networking engineers at the company, which uh, in a, you know, sort of a three, 400 site people organization is quite small. Um, and I was, you know, burning the candle at both ends a lot. And, you know, I, I never forget um, my manager went away for a couple of weeks and he used to do a lot of the reporting side of things. So numbers back to the board. Um, and he was like, can you fill in for me when, when you go away? The, this is what you need to do. It's only a couple of hours. And I was like, yeah, no worries. And I think after the third week of him being away, I just got to that point where I was like, it was, I think it was like half one in the morning and I'm sitting there looking at an Excel spreadsheet, trying to work out why my utilization numbers don't match up to what the, the you know, the, the reporting system is telling me. And I'm like, I'm going to get asked this. The CFO needs this tomorrow. And I just got to that point where I was like, I'm in the wrong role. And, you know, I, I hit that ceiling. It's like, I, I had that question of, you know, my wife's really good at this, actually. She always, when I get to this stage um, or my burnout stage, she, she makes me write lists and I hate doing it, but I know she's right. Um, and she makes me write a pros and cons list about everything that's going on in my life. Uh, and actually, she's, she's almost like the mediator in that. It's like she writes. She, she, I just, uh, you know, send message to, to the wife and this is what's going on. And then we just tally up, you know, pros and cons and tick things off that I can change, things that I can't change. And we, we come to a decision at the end of it. And in that scenario, it, it was like, I don't hate technology. I don't hate the company. I'm just in the wrong role. I'm just doing the wrong thing. You know, I, I love technology. That's where I need to go back to. And that's where I made that change back into architecture. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. And what would you say your, your top three tips would be to someone either starting out in technology or is already in technology, but feels like they're in a rut? 
I would say write a list as much as I hate saying this, uh, write a list, honestly, pros and cons, like what you're doing today, what you love about your job, what you hate, hate about your job or hate maybe the wrong, too strong of a word, but it's one that I'll use, um, you know, and how you think you can change it. Think of some possible solutions. I, I've always said in life that don't just be a problem creator, be a problem solver. So if you're going to raise a problem, think about how you can solve it. You might not have the answer, but by showing that you may have an answer or a way out of the rut that you're currently in when you go and speak to somebody in you know management or, or above or somewhere else at least it shows that you're not just creating a problem and you've got no way out of that you're, you're giving them ideas they then may spark other solutions that they may be thinking of but you know you're meeting them in the middle so that's one one top tip um honestly if if you're starting out in in tech career get yourself in the social world so getting part of the community is absolutely fantastic and the mvp community is great to go back to so recently i was working on some arm templates um, I got hit with an issue. Docs couldn't help me. Nothing could help me. I was just stuck. And you know where you do that whole thing, you walk away from it and you're like, I'll solve it, rubber duck, talk to the rubber duck. It'll tell me what's going on. No, none of that helped. Um, I've literally reached out to somebody I know who's another MVP on Twitter, um, a guy called Sam Kogan, um, who is an like a arm template wizard. Um, check out his arm template masterclass series on YouTube if you haven't. Yeah, I'll put a and, link um, to somewhere here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll put a link to it. But I literally went, dude, I'm struggling with this. Um, this is what I'm hitting. And he was just like, mate, send me, send me the arm template, send me an email, what you're doing, um, and I'll have a look when I get five minutes. A couple of hours later, he's like, I've actually found this. This is the way around it. Hope that helps. And that's where, you know, lean on the community is really powerful in that stage because people are willing to help people are willing to go the extra mile but it's knowing how to use it and and not just use them as you know a constant i need help i need help i need help yeah. if you get truly stuck there are people there to help you you know probably like yourself kyle if somebody came to you with a really complex vmware or citrix issue you've probably been in that situation and can help them in that, in that scenario and probably would be willing to as long as it was you know in the right approach it's not of worst expected of you it's almost like please I'm, i need some help if you, if you can spare five minutes that'd be great yeah yeah and i think um on the thing with community, like there's a lot of things that people come and join the community, but then don't give back, right? And I think if you if you want that kind of um, engagement, you need to be reciprocal. You need to be able to put things out there and then take things as well. And, the, and one of the things that I know a lot of people always say is, well, I don't want to stand and present on stage, and I don't want to do this, and I don't want to do that. Well, do you know what? You might think it's a really difficult thing. It's not, right? Just going up there and having a conversation conversation with a group of people that you're ultimately going to want to have a beer with afterwards in a lot of cases, right, when we're not in this situation. And and actually just looking at it from that point of view, that it's no different than talking to a friend, that it should make it a lot simpler for you. You don't even need to prepare a slide deck, right? If you've got a really interesting story, and it doesn't even have to be massively interesting, right? Just be, what, what did you do last week for a customer? What did you do internally on your own internal system? And how did you overcome it? And share that with the community, because then actually, if, you, if they don't learn anything from you, you've learned then how to present. And so, exactly. well. so it's a really good stepping stone for people to get into that kind of how do I present how do I hold myself on stage all that kind of stuff yeah you know me and you have spoken at some pretty big conferences you know I've spoken at Future Decoded you've spoken at various VM worlds and, and, and like and it does you know we still probably get the nerves you know even at my user group going up to start the night is is a nerve-wracking thing right um, but it only gets better with experience in doing it um, and you learn that people are actually people humans are pretty good cool and pretty chill about most things you don't have to be perfect you know the amount of times that my demo's gone wrong or you know i've said something in the wrong way and completely mis, mis um explain something you know it's fine to backtrack hold your hands up be honest people are there really supportive but as you say getting started is the, is the hardest thing and just just throw yourself in at the deep end get, give it a go the community are really supportive and if you are nervous reach out to, to other people in the community I, I never i remember a community event that happened last year uh the azure advent calendar and i was speaking to a few people about their submissions i was doing one um, another colleague of ours Anthony master was doing one and you know everybody was having great fun and i spoke to somebody else in the community who should remain nameless um i'm you know was really nervous about his content you know really worried about miss saying something it not being appreciated it not being the right thing and i was like mate nobody's going to be nobody's going to be say this is horrific or shout call you out this is all about community and it's all about giving back everybody's really supportive around you and you know three or four of us all had the same conversation and boom his submission went live and absolutely best thing he did and i think the thing for me is is, is, is that diverse opinion which is what makes it better in debate and debate is what makes people learn from both sides of the fence. And I think that's, that's really key. I, I love debate. I, I love having a conversation with someone where they are adamant. They are right. And I'm adamant that I am right. And we're both wrong. <laughs> that's great <laughs> when that happens. Right. And, and I think from my perspective, like you, you're going to learn new ticks, new tips and tricks and all that kind of stuff by, by engaging with the community. 
Absolutely. Um, okay, so let's let's move on to industry, right? So um, obviously a lot changes, especially in the cloud world uh, that you, you focus on today. But what would you say is the biggest change since you started in IT to today? The biggest change is it is that whole thing of um one thing that's quite funny and, and pertinent at the moment is that is the year of the VDI. I think we may have finally found it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it has been a savior to most businesses along. And I think Windows Virtual Desktop was so, so well timed in that. Um, you know, I, I'm dealing with a few clients who have got, you know, two, 3,000 users using Windows Virtual Desktop um, and other, you know, partner solutions. So Citrix, some of them are using on top or Horizon from VMware. Um, but it saved their business. You know, they've gone from having no remote working capabilities to something within a very short space of time. Um, and now they're it's obviously opened their minds to how they can consume cloud services in a, in a whole new light because it saved them. Now we can move towards it because we know it works. Um, but I think the biggest shift in the tech career is that how much code is coming into the world, no matter what role you're in, uh, code is becoming a thing. So, you know, when I looked at Jason, probably the first time I ever saw it, I was like, yeah, I'm never going to be doing that. I, I now write it on a daily basis and, you know, very comfortable with it, something I'm, I'm there with and something that I look back on um, as a thing that I probably didn't get on board with too early. So I used to be a networking engineer and the amount of times I'd be editing Notepad++ files with like Cisco config in and like <laughs> making line changes and then be like, oh, why didn't that work? And then being comparing files to each other. If I'd have used Git and GitHub and been submitting my changes every time I did something, I've got a full audit history about exactly what I've changed and where. The amount of time that would have saved me and the amount of pain that that would have, you know, reviews and all those things, constant backup of all my configs instantly, you know, all, all there. That's one thing that I would say that the drive for normal IT operations people getting on board with um, GitOps processes. So, yeah. you know, platform ops, if we call it that. Um, I think the most inspiring thing for me was I read the, uh, the Phoenix project. Um, and I just picked it up as a sort of, it's a, ner it's a nerdy book, you know, I, I love that I can't read fiction or anything like that, but it seemed to be a good good balance between what I could could read and relate to. Um, and it just inspired me. I was like, I'm just going to need to get, I just need to throw myself in, just start using it. And, you know, I can't follow labs. I can't follow things like that because I always know it's not real. So I threw myself in the deep end. I had a blog on WordPress and I was like, right, I'm going to go and convert this to something called Hugo. Um, and it's going to be all built and deployed with infrastructure as code and as a DevOps pipeline. So every time I make a new change on my local VS code and push it up, it's going to go and deploy my website and just get hands on and it just growing that confidence. So I, I have to get a tangible project to go and change things. And I think that's the one thing that has, has changed the most for, for me in the industry is code. Yeah, definitely. And what do you say has been, obviously the pandemic's had a lot of impacts, positive and negative in some cases. Um, what have you seen from your your travels between customers and, and even just working internally at Microsoft? What's been the most positive and potentially negative things you've seen? So I think the most positive is, is people's willingness, that community aspect inside of customers to just get together and solve problems where you, you may have had big boundaries before between departments. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of my customers just pull together as a unit, as a, an IT function that may be very, very diverse and split out across the organization, but come together to meet a, a business challenge so they can carry on working during these weird times. So I do a lot of work in, uh, in the media and entertainment and telecoms industries. Um, so, you know, big national broadcasters, all those sort of things. And the way they've come together as a, a big organization to solve very, very unique, specific challenges for things like how do we produce content uh, in a COVID world? How do we get content? You know, we can't access offices now as we used to. How do we do all these sort of things? And just that innovation of people actually talking to each other and, and you know, that, that sort of element has been phenomenal. Um, the negative side, I think it's, you know, the one that we're all realising, right? Some people are in much worse situations than, than others. Um, and it's hard to see and hard to deal with because some customers are very unsure about what the future looks like for them as a business. Um, and that's a tough conversation. Um, you know, I do a lot of things like cost optimization and stuff like that in my job and trying to help customers reduce their costs. But it's really seeing, you know, that the, some of the people there are really unsure about what the future holds for them as a, as a business and, a, and as a job. And, you know, that that's an awful thing to have to deal with and that have to face day to day. Yeah, definitely. I know that we've touched on a few other sessions where the, the whole social impact to it and humans as social individuals generally anyway, and we're not getting that kind of engagement, the water cooler conversations, the, the cheeky pint after work and all that kind of stuff just doesn't happen anymore. And it's, I think it is starting to grind people down a little bit, but I think on the aspect of people losing work and potentially not becoming unemployed all of a sudden, uh, again, banging on about community, but having that community to help you find your next role is key, right? And 
employers are more willing to recruit someone that's been referred by someone they trust that isn't by a recruitment agency in some circumstances. Sorry, Kaz, who was on the other night. But, <laughs> um, but the thing for me is, is that businesses pay a significant money to a recruitment agent to find you and bring you on board. If you can be referred by someone internally in that business or by a friend, they don't have to pay that fee, which works both ways, right? It can mean that you might be able to get more money as an individual, or they're actually saving money as a business by recruiting you as well. Um, so there's those kind of aspects to look at, definitely. Yeah, and people are still recruiting out there, right? So we, we announced a load of roles, uh, very similar roles to what I do. We, we announced a few in the UK the other day. People are still recruiting. You know, we are still growing as an industry. People are needing us more and more. It may just be the specific place that you work is, is struggling and having a hard time. But yeah, how many things have you seen on LinkedIn recently of like, you know, if you, uh, here's a recommendation of this great person, they'd be a great fit for X, Y, or Z role. And that's great to see, you know, that there's so many things like that. And, you know, if you've got a good relationship, you know, like if you, if you, any of us were to be in that position, I'm pretty sure either of us would help each other out as much as we could. Yeah, definitely. It's the way it has to work, right? But it's a very, very uh, incestuous industry to work in. So you don't want to, don't want to burn any bridges, just put it that way. Absolutely. Um, so if we think about, technology what's taking your interest at the moment so interest at the moment for me is how the how 5g is going to change the world so i'm doing a lot with some telcos at the moment um and 5g is very much on their radar um, and obviously microsoft made the acquisition of meta switch um recently um and they are pretty much leaders in the 5g space and in the switching elements of that um and i'm, I'm actually involved in a project that's, that's utilizing that with a large large telco um and it's really really interesting it's fascinating and it's something that uh, being a network engineer you'd think i'd understand completely out <laughs> of my depth like have no idea what they're talking about and then occasionally something like some phrase will pop up and i'm like i know what that is um so i spend a lot of my time researching that 5g market but then also thinking about the you know what that's going to enable us discussing with my wife over dinner the other night and you know the fact that we could be anywhere in the world with 5g coverage and you know live streaming without any glitches or anything like that or using an, a, a virtual desktop from wherever we are with a good performance you know all of those opportunities that just instantly open up by having great connectivity you know we take it for granted being in a in the uk we have pretty good connectivity from wherever we go but you know go on holidays to say cornwall or scotland and you may find yourself with those those black spots where you, you have nothing can you realize how much you take these your phones and stuff like that for granted obviously we saw apple announced the iphone 12 uh, this week 5g support uh, is coming right and i think you know it's going to enable so many how many project sd1 projects have me and you done together um that 5g just enables you know building sites to spin up instantly because you don't need anything but a sim card effectively you know all of these spin up offices think of the new like nightingale hospitals that have had to get the comms lines put in 5g can solve all these challenges with performance that none of us can even achieve today with some lease lines yeah. so it's going to be a great thing. It's just how we consume it and how we make it accessible, I think. Yeah, and how, how we make it cost effective is the biggest one for me because with all these new technologies that come to market, they often start off up here, right? And then they start to slowly become more cost effective for general population utilization. I think the good thing is with 5G primarily is it will just get bundled into consumer services like your phone bills and all that kind of stuff, right? And whether take my B, my home broadband providers bt right whether bt are providing me an actual line or whether it's a 5g connection unlimited i really couldn't give a monkey so long as it works yeah um, and that's the decisions that they will make as service providers not us as consumers ultimately yeah it's yeah. going to be a really interesting space that that 5g world so one to watch and i feel like maybe another year it'd be really interesting to see how far we progress i think a lot of us will be using it in our day-to-day -day lives in a year yeah, one hundred percent, and I hope I do in this middle of nowhere, right? Because it'd be crazy. You say you always struggle with your with your broadband, so yeah, it'd be great for you. <laughs> and looking at this thing stays active. Um, <laughs> so if we think about like unsung heroes of technology, so my example of this, right? I've used this in every single session, but it's an easy example for me. Uh, Microsoft Flow, right? Not uh, so it's, for me, it's an unsung hero. It can do so much, and it's quite easy to use, but no one even knows it exists. It exists like outside of IT. Right. So if I'm a, an accountant or I'm someone in HR or whatever, there's things that that could do for me to make my life easier that I'm just not aware of. Is there any technology that, that you think is unsung that should have, have their this, pride of This play? is really interesting, right? So mine is Logic Apps. I always bang on about Logic Apps. So I think I've probably bored your ears at some stage about Logic Apps when we work together. Um, and that's what, you know, Flow is effectively built on or Power Automate is effectively built on, right? It's the same platform. Um, we were lucky enough to have the principal program manager come to one of our talks um, at the user group before obviously COVID hit, uh, a guy called John Farmer, uh, oh, sorry, John Fancy, 
Um, and he is the Logic Apps lead for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And he used to live in Brighton and he was back in the UK for a couple of days for a conference and came down and gave us a talk and just open up people's mind to it's no code effort most of the time. It's no click and drag connector blocks together to enable all of these business automation pieces that you may think would take forever to build and you know you need a complex development team to build. You don't. So I've done a really complex, really complex example recently where a customer has a load of they need to tag their resources right in Azure and they have a finance system SAP and they have all of their charge codes and accounts and whether they're allowed to consume Azure and what their limits are and all that stuff stored in SAP but that actually they've got a, a spreadsheet that comes out once a month from that system but with all the latest charge codes and there's also an API for that system that you know you can query the data out of um they want in a way of ensuring that their tag cost center values were the same as what was actually in you know was a, a known value within that organization um and I was like, cool, we've got a logic app for it. And the guy was like, no, 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 we can't build that. You know, we've, we've been thinking about this for months. And I was like, let's put two hours in the calendar and go for it. And okay, admittedly, the two hours, it, you know, you always need to get started and find the bugs and all those sort of things. I then spent the weekend working on it, you know, a couple of hours. Uh, and by Monday, so we started on a Friday, by the Monday, I had a working system that you gave me a spreadsheet and whether it was in OneDrive or wherever, uploaded to a logic app that then kicked off an Azure function to convert it to JSON, yeah. passed it back, and then sent off it an email saying, do these look all okay? Do you approve this? Hit approve. And then it went and amended an Azure policy saying these are the allowed tag values. Mm -hmm. And like, just a, that's mind blowing, you know, but then you've got, I've got other logic apps that do very simple things. Like um, if you follow me on Twitter and you see me update a blog article, I've got one that monitors my RSS feed and post a tweet when I've done something new, those sort of things that you, you know, taking that, that manual effort out of your day, um, yeah, the, the, I think my phrase that I'm using a lot with my customers is it's just a limit of your imagination and skills. And both of those you can solve very easily. Yeah, and I think um, it always makes me laugh a little bit when I go into it to a customer, right? And we're talking about CSAT scores or we're talking about how they survey the service they're delivering or the, the, the solution they're implemented in or even their migration effort, right? So how has your experience been migrated from Windows 7 to Windows 10 or whatever it might be? And people sit there and go, yeah, but we don't want to spend money on SurveyMonkey. I'm like, okay. Don't you have a M365 subscription? Yeah, you've got forms, right? Yeah, you can do it on there. <laughs> I'm like, can you? Yes, let me show you. And then 15 minutes later, you've got a, a form that you can use over and over again. It basically zero cost, right? Yeah. And, and that, that for me is just, again, it's just that, that awareness because I, I think a fortunate but unfortunate thing for Microsoft as a business is there's so much that it does that it's easy to lose some of the portfolio in. And I think that's where customers get just get overwhelmed by all this stuff, right? And just like, well, I, I, I do it this way, so I'm going to carry on doing it this way. Exactly. Um, and that's where partners, like who I work for, come in and try and help them, people on that journey. Yeah, same. Yes, that's exactly what my role is. I'm here to be the the evangelist. I'm here to know what's going on. And you tell me your business problem. I'll tell you how to fix it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Walk me through that problem, and then we'll come up with some crazy way of maybe fixing it, if at all. Absolutely. <laughs> so if we um. If we then think about the next area. So an area of technology within organizations that is undervalued and underinvested. Undervalued and underinvested. That's a really, really good. I think governance is honestly one of the, the, the areas. So it's one I deal with a lot with Azure. And uh, if any of you know my Azure that sort of background, I'm a big governance fan. Um, so most of this stuff is free to, you know, put in place and consume and set up. Um, but it gets neglected and then all that happens is you get six nine twelve months down the line and you know somebody's coming back to you saying my bill's too much or we've got cloud sprawl or we don't know which bits of the this this uh azure subscription is belongs to which application and we don't know a data to... warehouse that cost 30 grand in a month and didn't realize it <laughs> yeah yeah that, that happens to all the best of us there's uh, definitely definitely still happens out there but you know those things are easily solvable but by investing in the governance up front or investing in a team that can look after that it's not just a it shouldn't be a bolt onto a role it shouldn't be an it admins bolt onto their day job you've got to be passionate about this stuff because it's you sit across both sides you sit across sort of a finance side and a training side as well as the technical side so you need to be able to educate your users how they're going to you know how why you're putting these policies in place what they should do to avoid it in the future and also you know then how do i go and apply that technically how do i do that I've, I've got a thought on this, right? And my view on governance is, is obviously there's two sides. It's cost management and then there's compliance, right? Um, compliance, I think, firmly generally fits within 
the technical community. But cost management, as far as I'm concerned, should sit with procurement. And the reason for that is procurement in the business is there to drive value and reduce costs where possible, right? And to negotiate where possible. And if your procurement team have a vision and a view on how they reduce that cost and be that third party that comes into IT and says, do you really need it to be that big? Does it really need to be on 24 by seven? And they can show a saving to the business on that side of it. I think that's another way of implementing governance from a cost model perspective without having to worry about IT people trying to do it. I, I, I firmly believe it sits there for that kind of stuff. And then let them be the, 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 the people in the background that come and point fingers and ask you questions rather than IT to IT. I think, yeah, I think I agree with that to some, some aspects. I think it's about enabling those people to have the data and have the tools to be able to go and ask those questions yeah. instead of it just being, you know, they get a spreadsheet at the end of the month with a bill and they fire it out and go, tell me what's going on. Why has this gone up? You know, giving them the tools to be able to go and work that out themselves without having to come and, you know, distract people. It builds a better relationship internally. Everybody becomes tighter. Um, and, you know, there's then like that, oh, well, finance are going to send me a spreadsheet at the end of the month and I need to work out how to do it. That's yeah. something that, you know, a logic app, again, is well, something for you. If we all so, should have a lesson learned from what we've seen in the news recently, no one should be using these things in spreadsheets, right? Um, very it's very true. easy to meet the limitations if you're not careful. Um, and you should be using databases and maybe analytics platforms like Power BI and whatever else to, 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 to drive value from that data rather than using Excel spreadsheets with pivot tables. Right? Absolutely. And I think, you know, the phrase I always use is guardrails. You, you want to enable your developers, your users of the platform who are de delivering value back to your business, access to whatever they want it whenever they need it. But by from the compliance and cost perspective, putting the platform in place. So using things like Azure policy to just keep people on the straight and narrow all the time. Mm. Um, and, you know, these things cost nothing to implement, just some brain time and, uh, you know, putting things into place and, and, and applying technology, which can massively save the headaches and conversations later on down the line. Yeah, definitely. So fun time, lightning round. Love it. Last technology purchase. Ooh, last technology purchase. That's a, that's a really good question. What was my last sentence? Ah, my uh, Surface Laptop Go. <laughs> Obviously. So, yeah, yeah, I saw it announced. The wife needed a new laptop. So um, yeah, we, we made, the, made the purchase. Perfect. Biggest inspiration? Biggest inspiration. It's hard. I'm actually going to say my, my dad. My dad has always taught me my work ethic of, you know, you've got to work for what you want in life. Um, you know, Bless his heart, it still works longer hours than I do every day, but it's always been, it's been ingrained to me from a very young age. You've got to work and, you know, yeah. work gives you these things in life. So yeah, my, my father. I think, I think most people on here have either said their wife because they're scared of having any repercussions or they've said their father. Yeah, most people have said gone down that route. Okay, so what, what does work-life balance mean to you? What, what, what's work-life balance? <laughs> is, that, is that the answer <laughs> yeah work-life balance to me is uh it, it should be um taking an adequate amount of time so you afford you you getting burnt out and still enjoying your day job whether i achieve a good work-life balance yet to be discovered and i think we all could say that in the industry yeah definitely um your favorite book uh favorite book i'm gonna go i don't know i'm gonna go the phoenix project just yeah. it's changed a lot in my life yeah. uh what did you want to do when you finished school Sad, I wanted to work in IT, so sorry, that's a bad answer, but I've always wanted to work yeah. in IT. It was, it was to become a chef or work in IT for me, and then I realised I didn't like the unsociable hours of being a chef, and I liked the idea of being a chef because I could cook food and then eat it, which you can't do as a chef. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a health and safety issue, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the most important thing to you? Uh, the most important thing to me is family always family um no matter what it is what, you know if somebody was to call me now while we're doing this and somebody needed me i'm off um family is always important to me yeah. what would be your words of wisdom if it was a tweet oh so 200 240 characters and less um live the dream but don't let the dream burn you out nice okay favorite song a uh, bit of sweet symphony by the verve Okay, that was quicker than anyone else has answered, right? Everyone else has just panicked. I'm a big uh, music, a big music nerd, so <laughs> that, that is my thing. Um, fill in the blank. The new normal is teams meetings. <laughs> That's true. It just so uh, is. Uh, must watch TV show. Uh, the social dilemma. Have you watched that one yet? No. no Scary. Um, so uh, on Netflix, all about the people who have like invented the like button on Facebook and Instagram and why they put it in and what 
impact that's had on the world. I'll put it this way. I've now got screen time limits on my social media apps. That's how much it changed me, like, instantly. Perfect. So. On, on that note, like, subscribe. <laughs> yeah, like and subscribe <laughs> and share. <laughs> <laughs> and final question, uh, what is your favourite junk food? Do you not have moods for junk food? Well... To be fair, yes, I do. But I just like any kind of junk food, to be fair. Yeah. Uh, so if, I, if I'm going to go, like, my favourite, favourite dirty takeout, it's got to be KFC every day of the week. And, like, you know, we're, we're talking boneless banquet, but for four people for myself. <laughs> we're going all out. Fantastic. I think on that note, I'm absolutely starving and I, and I could do with some food. But thank you very much for your time, Jack. It's been great. And hopefully we can do something again in the future. No, thanks for having me, Carl. Um, anytime.